Today's lecture is on free will and determinism. And you might be thinking, well, what, what does free will and determinism, isn't that like a philosophical discussion? What does that have to do with psychology? Um, I think it actually has a lot to do with psychology because our, depending on, on how we side on this question will influence our understanding of what is a person? You know, what is, is a person capable in some sense of self-fashioning you know, th their, their person? Like, are they able to choose in some ways who they will become? Um, or is it just all sort of an unfolding chain of events that are outside of their control and what you think to be choices, they're actually just you know, illusions, it's epiphenomenal, it doesn't have any causal efficacy and so on. So this is a really important question and it's, it's bizarre that, uh, to me anyway, it's, it's a bit bizarre, that psychologists, and again, to me, this, this goes back to that question, I think psychology has kind of lost its way. Like it's really uh, misunderstands, you know, what, what it should be trying to clarify here. So there's, in the broader cultural narrative, there's, you know, lots of people that think that free will is an illusion, that, you know, agency is, is a fiction. Um, and this interpretation, once it's taken up by the culture, it, it creates a sort of looping effects, right? Where, where it alters our understanding of ourselves and arguably it can, you know, kind of create this sort of cultural nihilism or this excessive passivity and, and we view ourselves as either victims of our biology or victims of society and, and all this other kind of thing. So where you stand on this question is actually really, really important. And I am somewhat disappointed that there aren't psychologists like really making an issue of this. And it sort of makes sense in a way, like when you think about like, or there's a parallel there when you think about, well, what happened to humanism? What happened to existentialism? Where are these theories? Um, why don't we like have whole courses on these topics anymore? And, you know, again, like, well, these theories, you know, you know, take it as, as, uh, as a starting point that you do have, you know, volitional agency, you do have choice and, and so on. Um, so as we sort of lose sight of, of the insights from, I guess, these different theories, then what are we left with? Well, we're left with, you know, more of the mechanistic type theories. And um, yeah, and, and potentially run, run the risk of misunderstanding ourselves. So um, I don't claim to have all the answers here. Um, if, if I did, I'd write a book and I'd, I'd probably, you know, get lots of money for it. But, um, but I've been thinking about this stuff uh, for a fairly long time. And there was a period when I was really obsessed and worried about, you know, that, you know are we just biological machines and so on. And uh, for about three years, like I, I read, you know, at least 60, 70 journal articles and, you know, close to 10 books on, on this topic. So there was a time when I was really well versed in all this kind of debate and dialogue and whatnot. And uh, there are two books that really stood out for me. Um, this should be a lesson in a way, like, you know, th th some of the most profound books that are ever written on really important topics, they are just really hard to find, you know, and, and people have said some, some just brilliant things, but you know, it, it never makes it out there to the mainstream. Two of the books that, uh, that uh, I want to highlight here, just if you're curious about this stuff, and if you see some value in the approach that I've been taking with, with the course, uh, and uh, you know, your thinking kind of lines up with, with some of the things that I'm drawing attention to, uh, by no surprise, I, I don't think, Joseph Reichlach's book called uh, Discovering Free Will and Personal Responsibility. And uh, he makes a, a very persuasive argument. Uh, it's intellectually rigorous, scientifically rigorous, and, uh, and we'll kind of get into some of this. But, uh, but uh, another book that uh, it's out of print right now, and I, I don't know why I picked it up. Or I, I, I think one of the things that I'm, I'm good at, in a way, if I can toot my own horn here for a minute, is I've, I've gotten really good, I think, at um, like, maybe you guys are, are good at this too, right? If, if you've practiced it enough, like reading Amazon reviews and kind of going through, you don't want to read like the top five point reviews because they're all people that are maybe not prone to critical thinking and whatnot and it's all super awesome or whatever. And, and the one point reviews usually, you know, are, are just like it just didn't fit with their ideological suppositions or whatever. But you kind of read those sort of middle reviews and you read like, okay, does this person seem to have a grasp of, you know, the, the, the uh, 
the discussion, like what is being discussed here? Are they familiar with the literature? Um, is it a, a nuanced sort of argument uh, uh, or not? And I feel like I've gotten a bit of a knack for that. So um, I've, uh, you know, so this is a book that I, I uh, uh, was lucky to pick up, and it's the most straightforward kind of book that uh, highlights some of the issues. I think it's called *The Lawless Mind*, right? And now that you may look at that and just cr cringe immediately because like, oh, I mean, there's a double cringe, right? Because on, on the one hand, you mean like the mind is, is like lawless, like there are no causal laws at play at all. That sounds like terrible. And then we're using this mind thing, right? The mind is loaded with all these suppositions that we've been railing against in the, in the course. Um, but uh, the title is actually misleading. Um, it's actually a, a, a very persuasive argument. He's, he's just making a, a distinction between uh, causal laws in the material efficient sense, he doesn't use it, this terminology, and you know, like societal rules that, that don't operate on that level. So he's making that comparison. And he's using mind, I guess, because you know, just everyone uses mind. Uh, but he seems to have a nuanced take on it. So we'll be kind of looking at some of this in uh, in today's discussion. If anyone's curious to have a peek at, at these books during office hours or after class or whatever, you're welcome to do so. Okay. Um, so there, I'll say this. So there are two ways of, if you wanted to come at this free will determinism problem, um, I, I should say as well, just as an aside, uh, arguably, you remember we're talking about Heidegger and Wittgenstein and, and how they, they suggested that much of what is being done in, in philosophy, they're dealing with pseudo problems. They're not actual problems. Like the mind-body sort of problem is, is actually not a problem unless you kind of take up certain assumptions. Uh, well, as far as I can tell, like I, I think the free will issue is, is exactly like that in a way. It's only a problem if, if you assume, well, let's review this really quickly right now. It's only a problem if you assume that the only kinds of causes that are efficacious are material efficient causes. And, and it's a problem if, if you imagine that formal final causes are like an illusion or something. So material causes, again, we're talking about substance, matter, uh, just the materiality of, of some entity or object or thing. Efficient causes is the motion or changes, events. We're talking about like the laws of physics and thermodynamic processes and, and friction and all this other kind of stuff. It's mostly you know, understanding cause from an extrospective third person frame. If we take seriously though the, the first person experiencer, the subject, the agent arguably, we have a, a formal cause patterning, uh, you know, what, sh what allows something to show up as intelligible within a given culture. And we can imagine that sort of um, showing up in sort of a representational mode of intentionality, that, that we're aware of these conceptual objects, so to speak. Um, but it's also just our, part of our you know, dwelling absorbedly in a culture and just intuitively kind of in a ready-to-hand way, um, engaging with the world that, it, that uh, has some, some meaning. And then there's final cause, which is the reason, the purpose, the goal, the intention, and so on. Um, and so this is going to be important in, in terms of uh, framing this stuff. So if you've been following along in the lectures and, and you're roughly on board with this, I, I think you know, much of what we talk about here is, is going to make sense. It's, it's well, of course, you know, formal final cause is a thing, and, and arguably that's where you know, the, the free will, uh, in a limited sense, comes from. Okay, so people simply are not uni uh, unilinear chain-like successions of motion events to be calculated and tabulated without consideration of the telos, the reason for the sake of which this motion is being expended. They are self-determining, albeit often inconsistent, agents of their behavior. This is uh, Joseph Reichlach. So just to kind of frame this up a little bit, determinism is the position where every event is causally necessitated by antecedent or prior events and conditions of the environment together with the laws of nature, the laws of physics. That's roughly what, what we mean by determinism. So I'm, I'm framing this as, as physical determinism. That's what we're talking about. So given how things are at time t, the events that follow are fixed as a matter of, of natural law. That's the determinist uh, position. All objects and events are ultimately and most completely explained 
arguably, uh, by a causal reduction from psychology to biology to chemistry and ultimately to physics, which is uh, uh, material efficient uh, causality. So it's, it's prioritizing, it's emphasizing, uh, mostly like an, an efficient cause, spatial temporal unfolding of entities and events impinging upon one another in this causal chain. Um, so Sam Harris, uh, we can quote him as saying, our actions are the product of brain states which are themselves the result of prior causes which in turn are generated by a universe over which we have no control. So the, I guess the, the most uh, well-known proponent of, of this uh, position it would be Sam Harris. And if someone uh, is really sympathetic to this, uh, you know, I, I probably, I'm not going to convince you, I'm, I'm sure. But if you want to channel your inner Sam Harris and, and sort of try to flank some of the arguments or whatever uh, in today's class, you're more than welcome to do that. I, I would encourage you to do that. Um, there are two sort of approaches, I think, to, to coming at this. You know, one is to try to present a positive argument for, you know, some limited sense of free will which we'll do at the first part of the lecture. And then another approach is to you know, present a negative argument against physical determinism to basically show that physical determinism, if you take that doctrine seriously, it, it leads to all sorts of inconsistencies uh, that don't really make any sense. Um, so I don't claim to have any knockdown argument in some material efficient causal sense. Right? The, the way that this debate is framed, you know, the people who you know, kind of work from this framework, they're saying, well, look, where is the special sauce, right? Where is the special ingredient that, that gets you to free will or something like that, right? And the way that they frame it, though, is that they're, they're looking for some materiality. They're looking for some kind of ish, efficient thing that they could look at from the outside, from an extrospective frame, and sort of get you to that point. There's nothing like that, right? And it's misunderstanding, arguably, what, uh, what free will really is. In order to appreciate free will, you have to recognize that there is, um, you know, a, an agent, a subject who uh, is embodied, uh, who has, uh, you know, the, the being here or the being there of experience, um, and they can comport themselves in various ways. Um, okay, so that's determinism. Free will is the thesis that, with respect to a contemplated future act, we are sometimes, we sometimes find ourselves in positions where we simultaneously have the ability to perform the act or refrain from performing the act. So free will in the way that, that we would want to defend it here, um, again, it's, it's not that you have absolute control and choice over everything in your life. That, that is surely a fiction, right? We, Again, we, we, have, we are operating within a number of constraints. There are biological constraints, right? You do not you know, choose your genes or anything like that. You do not you know, have any you know, volitional choice over how your nervous system is going to respond to uh, various drugs and substances that you ingest into your body. Um, all of this is arguably just playing out at the level of material efficient cause, right? And, uh, and we are also operating within a realm of sociocultural constraints, right? You did not choose your language. You were thrown into this cultural disposition, uh, which has this symbolic mode of communicating, you know, the various uh, customs and rules and, and whatnot. That is just all something that you take up, typically unthinkingly, right? Um, and so again, there, there are just all these, these different constraints that are at work, both at the level of biology and at the level of the sociocultural uh, stuff. So, but uh, free will is, is that narrow range of you know, possibilities that are available to us you know, despite those constraints. So determinists claim that free will is impossible. Uh, according to them, it will require a violation of physical law. This is uh, the, uh, the causal closure of physics doctrine. So th there can never be a violation of a physical law, right? So they emphasize this, this point. Um, so it roughly states that all physical effects are due to physical causes. So that's sort of a, a hidden assumption in the backdrop of this. So again, they're assuming that the only kinds of causes that can be efficacious are material efficient causes. 
Thus, free will must be an illusion perpetuated by ignorance of the relevant causes. Okay, so let's look at some of the assumptions in the debate and see where we go with it. Um, again, a lot of this is, is from Raziel Abelson's book. We can contrast intentional actions, acts, and natural events, where natural events follow one another out of causal necessity. He calls this uh, dyadic causality, but this is, you know, in the terminology that we've been using, just efficient cause, right? A spatial tempor temporal unfolding of events. Intentional acts, in contrast, are mediated by the first person subject engaged in mental processes such as predication, interpretation, inference, judgment. This is all part of, of formal cause and final cause. So uh, when we're engaging in, in predication, we are you know, in the process of, in the first person, uh, we are affirming or denying or qualifying one pattern of meaning and extending that in, in how it relates to a more narrow pattern of meaning. So if I say that, uh, you know, that John is reliable, right? So I, I take the category of, of reliability and I extend that to envelop or include John, right? And there's this uh, bipolarity or oppositionality or dialectic, if you will, in how some of these categories are framed. So again, reliability to have an intuitive, this understanding of what that means, right? It's not something you can point to. It's something that to understand reliability, you, you have to have some sense of, you know, the synonyms of, you know, kind of consistency, stability, and, and you know, commitment, and whatever, but also the opposite, right? So unpredictable, chaotic, you know, non-committal, whatever. And you're affirming, as a subject, you're affirming one side of, of that, that uh, dialectic over another. And this is part of what we're doing in the act of, of predication and you know, making various judgments. We're affirming or denying or qualifying you know, a pattern of meaning in relation to another. And this is effectively what, uh, what Abelson calls triadic causality. So again, material efficient cause is just event A leads to event B to event C and, and so on, uh, all the way down the line and, and all the way back arguably to the Big Bang. Formal and final cause, you know, uh, involves, again, the, the, uh, the self-reflective subject or agent, you know, uh, consciousness, you know, Dasein, I, th I think, would be maybe the best way of putting it, that we are the clearing, we are the there or the here of experience. And sometimes we are able to appropriate, you know, these, these sort of meanings or concepts and, and we can reason for the sake of, of some end, some goal, some future possibility that matters to us. So it involves predicating, interpreting, inferring, a balancing of feelings, impulse, and, and reasoning. So we can be mindful of different impulses at work within ourselves. We can notice the difference between like an impulsive feeling or a drive that would compel us to do one thing and then what our rational mind you know, would, uh, would suggest that we do to, to fulfill some goal or some um, some meaningful interpretation of the kind of person that we want to be. It involves values, norms, rules, and you know, rules, we can conform to rules, certainly, right? And people who are operating in a mode of, you know, sort of inauthentic existence or something, they just do what one does, they say what one says, and they just conform to rules. Well, what is a rule? Well, a rule is a prior process of predication. It's putting forward a premised content and you just affirm that and you abide by whatever that, that socio-cultural expectation is. But rules can be violated as well, right? You know, just even the thou shall not kill. Well, you can think about, okay, well, so I shouldn't kill, but, but you can imagine the possibility where actually you, you do. Now that may be disturbing for some people, um, but I think we can imagine, you know, various situations where we may we may decide that that is the, the right thing to do, or we may have a strong compulsion to do something like that if it meant uh, you know, saving or protecting someone that we cared about and, and whatnot. So it's a balancing of goals, intentions, uh, perceived consequences, 
in light of possibilities and probabilities. Um, somewhere, I think uh, Heidegger suggested that Dasein, you know, the, the being of the way of being of a person, the, the being, the clearing, the here, the there, um, that Dasein is its possibilities, that Dasein is, it ex exists in time, that we are projecting ourselves into possibilities both unthinkingly, but we also have the capacity to, to stand back from uh, our situation and evaluate and assess, you know, what, what will have meaning to us, what matters to us, what is of significance, what values will we affirm or deny. Um, in some ways, we are you know, capable of, of choosing the person that, that we will ultimately become. And that's a very important part of what it is to be human if, if we want to, to hold people accountable, if, if people you know, bear some responsibility for the lives that they're living. So on that, um, a person is a creature who can tell you what he or she is doing and experiencing. Brain modules, social classes, nations, corporations, and robots cannot tell us with personal authority what they are experiencing and doing, nor can they be punished or rewarded for their actions except by punishing or rewarding members, or in the case of robots, their operators. So agency is the capacity to decide a course of action. One way, of, again, of thinking about a decision, a decision is you know, a recognition of two or more future possibilities. And to decide uh, means to cut away. So we cut away one possibility, one future possibility, and we appropriate a future possibility in the service of some end that we're trying to realize. Right? That's what a, what a decision is. Computers don't make decisions, right? Computers are just this, this unfolding of material efficient causal uh, events. So de decision means having authority in saying what one perceives, what one feels, what they believe, and what one is doing. So it, in essence, it's embodiment. It's, it's the, the sense of existing in in a lived space, that we're inhabiting a body, we're dwelling within a body, and we are subject to these various experiences. There's no doubt about whose body this is, right? Whose thoughts these are. One's actions must be sufficiently voluntary. So one sometimes has the ability to do otherwise. So the actions of a robot, of a computer, are not voluntary. Right? It, it's just, if there's a given input, it guarantees an output unless there's a mechanical breakdown somewhere along that material efficient causal unfolding. And we provide the causal link between a motivating reason and the appropriate bodily movement. So again, it implies an ownership and thus a responsibility for our actions. Um, now, it's useful just to, to th consider like how this debate is, is typically framed. Um, and Abelson kind of sets this up in, in quite a vivid way, but it's roughly uh, a, presented as a choice between physical determinism, where everything is causally necessitated by, by physical events. And as a result of that, the consequence is that there's no real moral responsibility and indeterminism. Right? So action is not causally necessitated and causes are random. So this is where people maybe appeal to quantum mechanics and all this other kind of thing, randomness. Um, you're not going to get free will out of that. Right? So either one of these, these possibilities um, will not get you free will. And this is the apparent choice. But this is a false dichotomy. This is a false choice. Um, I should say that uh, people who consider themselves compatibilists, so that's a, a, a term uh, in this, uh, this area, where a compatibilist would, would say that determinism and free will are perfectly compatible, right? Um, but despite their nuanced arguments, most of these so-called compatibilists, they impale themselves on the determinist horn. So for example, Daniel Dennett, uh, redefines free will and the problem of determinism as hinging upon the notion of evitability, 
well, what is that? Is that even a word? Well, then it makes it up. Um, it's essentially avoidance. So he argues that the future is not predetermined or inevitable since evolutionary processes have endow endowed us with complex mechanisms for avoiding dangers and negative outcomes. But, I mean, if you stop and think about this for a minute, the avoidance mechanisms are themselves determined, so it can only be apparent avoidance, which for Dennett is you know, the only kind of free will worth wanting. So it's, it's only you know, our ignorance of the underlying material efficient causes that allow us to you know, kind of suggest in a way that it's, it's avoidance. But um, again, it's, it's uh, determinism all the way down as far as I can tell. Um, a lot of the debates, like if, if, uh, if you kind of follow some of the philosophical debates, it seems like there's a lot of uh, redefinition kind of going on. There's a moving of goalposts. Um, and it doesn't seem like they're, they're moving any further along in the debate. And I think it's one of these things that Heidegger would just be you know, totally outraged by because people are you know, getting their degrees and, and they can make a career of you know, dealing with these pseudo problems that are not actually problems. Um, features of agents with free will in, involve, for Abelson, desire, right? So unlike computers, we experience and have personal wants, wishes, and preferences. And again, there's, there's no question about whose desires they are, whose preferences they are. And we engage in self-monitoring, or at least sometimes we can engage in self-monitoring. So we can sometimes notice our states and activities, including perceptions, impulses, thoughts, feelings, behavior, and so on. And I think a large part of what we do in, in therapy is we, we encourage people to engage in some self-monitoring that, that they usually don't engage with. So we ask them questions like, well, look, what, what is the thought just now? Like, what, what's happening in, in terms of that inner dialogue? What do you notice in your body? What do you notice in terms of what you feel? How would you describe it symptomatically, right? So we, we encourage them to attend to different parts of their experience. What is the behavioral impulse that you have here in this moment? So, um, and, and when we do that, we notice often that, that there are competing demands, right? There are competing desires, right? I have a desire to engage with this conversation, but there's another part of me that's so uncomfortable, I just wanna walk out of here, right? That's a very common you know, experience in, in therapy. If anything therapeutic is, is gonna come out of that. Um, and then, and then what do we do? Well, well arguably, we, we kind of reason, like, well, what, you know, what do I want to be doing? What is my goal? What am I trying to achieve? And, and how do I throw my attentional resources you know, b behind that meaningful goal, right? How do I comport myself in a way that will realize that, that end state that I'm trying to achieve? So there's this means and reasoning. So, we allow or inhibit impulses, emotions, and so on based on our assessment of possible outcomes and how they align with, with our desires, our goals, our priorities. A reason may be brought into relevance causing one to revise one's priorities, especially when confronted with various problems including the psychic conflict, emotional dispositions, competing desires, and competing reasons. So, um, again, I don't know how, it, it, just a straightforward example of, of, I wonder how would a determinist char characterize what goes on in therapy, you know? That the therapist words somehow, right? Words are operating at the level of formal and final cause, arguably, but, but for the determinist, they, they imagine that, that reasons are, are like causes in the efficient sense, right? And that the therapist words somehow you know, kind of impinge upon the nervous system of, of that human being who is otherwise like passive or something, and it causes them to be less depressed or less anxious or something. Again, I don't think that's what we're doing. I think what we're doing is we're inviting them to attend to something, to notice something, to engage with something that they don't typically engage with. And it's up to them what they're gonna do with that, right? Um, I think therapists who don't recognize that this is what's going on, they get all bent out of shape because they imagine, well, I didn't use the right words, or I didn't use the right tactics or approach or, or whatever, and they imagine that it's all their fault that the, the, the client is not 
making uh, any movement in therapy. I mean, it could be, right? It could be. Um, but uh, I, I think we, we have to imagine that our, our patients, our therapy clients, are, are agents, right? They're capable, they have to engage in some of this stuff on their own. They have to decide for themselves what is worth doing, um, what they're willing, that, what discomfort they're willing to endure uh, to, to see themselves through the other side. Uh, according to Abelson, we cannot coherently raise the question of whether a decision was causally predetermined, for there are no causal laws linking antecedent conditions to decisions that are features of actions rather than distinct events. So essentially what he's saying is to raise the question is to misunderstand the phenomenon of deciding and to conflate agent-determined actions with uh, material cause events. So um, that is roughly a, a positive argument for free will. Um, before we move on to the negative argument against a physical determinism, does, does anyone have any questions or anything that they want to they ask at this point? Well, I, th I think the reasonable arguments are um, to what extent are we free? To what extent are we determined, right? Um, I mean, that's where I would position myself, you know. Um, what I'm r railing against is, is that, you know, the argument that there is no free will, not even a little tiny bit, right? At no point have you made any, any real uh, causally eff efficacious choice or decision. It was all just a, a product of your biology, your genes, your environmental kind of experiences and so on. That's the position that I, I would, you know, want to rail against here. Yeah, for, for better or for worse, like you, you, you are embodied. You, you know, you have some sense of ownership over this body, right? Like there's, there's a, a, a sense of volitional control over this body. And, and especially when you get into, I would say that, that, you know, our capacity for free will is maybe more limited, if, you know, if we were to imagine being just without language, right? Because without language, we're not able to, to think in terms of concepts and whatnot. And it's, it's arguably our capacity for thinking in that abstract way, right? So when I say that, um, you know, that, that Jane is, is caring, she's a caring person, right? Well, immediately I could say that and someone else may challenge me or I, I may reevaluate that and I say, well, Jane is actually not caring. And then I can say, well, Jane is not not caring. Right, and, and then I can do this sort of transcendental kind of negation of whatever is. That's, that's the thing about human beings, that computers can't seem to do that. We can always engage in this more refined analysis by negating whatever it is that we put forward in, in our, our you know, perception. Well, with free will, the, the, we, we, well, we, yeah, we recognize that, well, yes, of course, like, you know, I can't jump off a building and fly, and, you know, of, of course, I, I can't, you know, you know uh, drink caffeine and not, and not have my nervous system affected by that, of course, right? Um, but again, there's, there's that little wiggle room where, and, and I would say this as well, like, I think for, for much of the time, we are far less free than we think we are, right? I think that's true. You know, so we believe that, that we're making many choices and, and they're not actually ours, right? We think that, that we are. I think that's true. But I think it's also true that, that we can, you know, transcend beyond that as well. So let's get into the, this is the fun part. You know, this is <laughs> um, where uh, someone who claims to take up a, a physical determinist position, that you can argue it basically by, by tracking, like, the consistency of their position and how they comport themselves in, in the world and listening to what they're saying. And, and then you're basically, wait, what? what? What was this? Like, does your theory allow you to, to say that or do this or whatever? Um, just as a little example, if I, you know, just forget to mention this. So this morning I was, I was watching, uh, Sam Harris was recently on uh, the Joe Rogan podcast. And in the big, beginning little bit of this podcast, he was talking about um, you know, the, the red pill of, you know, free will and, and free will being an illusion and whatnot. And that once you swallow that pill, it, I can't remember the exact wording, something along the lines of, you know, it forces you to be far more forgiving of, of other people, right? Because presumably they were not, 
you know, able to, to choose the various outcomes and whatnot. Now, what is kind of, you know, suspicious or problematic of in that, do you think? Anyone? What does it mean to forgive someone? Let's start there. Like, can we forgive someone? Does it, like, it, does it make sense to use the term forgiveness as it relates to something that was absolutely outside of their control? So if someone, for example, if, if you know, you're sitting next to someone and they, they're holding a pen and, you know, there's like a, a brain clot or something that causes a knee-jerk reflex like this and they, st <laughs> they stab one of you in the eye, right? Uh, like, does it make sense to, to say, like, well, I forgive you, like... Or, or does it make more sense to say, oh, I understand what happened because, you know, the, you know, we rushed you off to the emergency room and kind of did this sort of biopsy or whatever, and we're able to discern that there's a, a mechanical, you know, malfunction in your brain or something like that. I think that's, you know, where I would want to go with it. Um, okay, so if you believe that there is only gene environment causality, then you regard formal final causes uh, presumably as fictions and the quote choices of the self-determining agent must be epiphenomenal. So again, epiphenomenal just means that it's, it has no causal efficacy, right? It's, it's just an illusion. Um, so if there is no real choice, then there's no reason to give someone praise for someone's hard work or moral behavior, right? They, they couldn't have done otherwise, nor is there reason to resent people for what they apparently did or failed to do, right? So our, our understanding of one another as moral agents, I, I think, would really crumble. Um, just a, a, a personal anecdote on, on this. So I had, uh, I started teaching this lecture, something like this, uh, last year. Um, and I had a student in the class and, and, you know, they were just a hardline determinist and, you know, I, I, I think that a lot of that doesn't make sense, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, but they asked me, uh, you know, would you, would you mind going for coffee and we can kind of talk about this and I can kind of pick your brain about some questions or concerns that I have. So I sat down with this person and, you know, we we're talking, kind of exchanging, you know, concerns and ideas and whatnot. And neither one of us was budging an inch, right? But it was a fun little exchange. And uh, toward the end, he, he shook my hand and he said, thanks. And I smiled and I said, you're welcome. And I walked out and I was thinking, hmm, what is he thanking me for, right? Because according to him, I, I couldn't have done other than, than meet with him, right? So why would he thank me? And then, and then I, I thought like in a mischievous way, and why should I acknowledge the thank you <laughs> by saying you're welcome, right? If I know that he thinks that I'm not in control of my actions, I couldn't have done otherwise, why should I even acknowledge that, right? So then if you imagine like if we were to live you know, in, in a way that is consistent with that belief, it, it would just be, uh, I don't know, like it would be pretty terrible, like, you know, like, um, wouldn't be very good. So feelings like, like anger, guilt, or shame become irrational and only seem to make sense because we mistakenly believe that others or we ourselves could have done other than what we in fact did. In reality, says the determinist, we are only ignorant of the underlying causes. So under determinism, notions of morality, justice, and punishment seem irrational or, or even pointless, it would seem. The current legal system would no longer make sense. We couldn't reasonably hold anyone accountable. Their behavior is the causal output of genetic and environmental events outside of their control, even if they believe otherwise, right? Yet, and this is what's curious, uh, the same determinists often claim that we should leave the justice system intact. Well, why is that? Well, they say that we need punishment as a form of deterrence for others. But in a deterministic world, how does one account for this notion of deterrence, right? Deterrence implies that you're able to anticipate, you know, some future possibility and outcome, right? And, and that there are various paths that you could take and you're gonna choose one over another, right? Isn't that out of bounds or off limits to someone who thinks in this way? So deterrence seems to require foresight and an ability to make a choice depending on two or more possibilities that could have been actualized and weighing potential consequences in relation to what matters. How is, how is that possible from this framework? 
in a deterministic world, there's no such thing as genuine choice or deliberately and meaningfully appropriating some possibility among alternatives that could have been actualized. Arguably, there is no such thing as even time, at least as we experience it uh, existentially in the first person, or a future in, in this deterministic world. They are fictions or illusions. There is only the reality of the past, which is also debatable. We only access the past through our you know, perceptual kind of uh, interpretation and concepts and, and things of that nature. And there's the actuality of the immediate uh, present. That, that is really the only thing that is real from this perspective uh, that's been pushed along by prior gene environment events and interactions. Um, so if decisions are really just the effect of a long string of physical causes, then there's no reason not to go all the way back to the Big Bang to get to the ultimate cause of some action. This view of decision making detaches the decision from the author, from the first person subject or agent. Nothing would ground it or prevent it from an infinite regress back to the ultimate chain that started it all. Um, this is an interesting sort of argument, I guess, but so in a deterministic world, how would one even explain or justify wanting to change things on what basis or, or ground? So if we are entirely the product of prior events in a material efficient sense, embedded in our genes and triggered or shaped by our environment, there's no such thing as knowledge and planning as we know it. So thoughts, ideas, and even reasons are presumably reduced to evolved mechanisms that had survival value as opposed to an approximation to truth. Why should our evolutionary mechanisms be oriented toward truth? Why, why would that be necessarily, or it's not entirely clear uh, in, in a, a straightforward way how that would be evolutionarily advantageous? Why not untruth, right? Why not you know, deception in some way? Why couldn't that have you know, some uh, survival value. So if the above is sound, or at least, you know, worth entertaining, then it potentially undermines the truth of the determinist theory itself, you know? If reasons are just reduced to some neural events or something like that, then, then how can we, you know, how can we trust in, in our, I don't know, like in, uh, in our, our ra rational dialogue, in um, our approximating some, some kind of truth? So arguably the determinist saws off the branch that they're sitting on, if we take that seriously. Now I was asking a, a philosopher friend of mine, like, well, why, why is this stuff so believable? Like, why do people like, think that this makes any sense at all to, to be a physical determinist? And this is the response that he gave me. He said, I think the difficulty in trying to get students to consider the absurdities of scientism is that ironically, they're all little Cartesians. So they can't take seriously what is implied in taking a fully reductionistic view of the self. They think of their physical endowment as a tool that the Cartesian I can use. They don't seem able to grasp the idea that affirming that everything is cause and effect is absurd. If everything is cause and effect, so is the noise. Everything is cause and effect, right? Um, so the determinist account seems to ignore or minimize the role of the first person experiencer, yet they often contradict their own theories by helping themselves to it, by appealing to an I, a we, or an internal subject that can somehow ground a temporal interpretation and or by appealing to a capacity to choose to override material efficient mechanism as is the case with Pinker. Now Pinker believes in free will, he's not a, a determinist, um, but he, his model, his, his uh, uh, mode of theorizing is, you know, material efficient causality. So his theory doesn't really allow him to, uh, to defend his position that there is such a thing as free will. And Daniel Dennett had mocked him on that account, right? Uh, he's critical of that. Um, so we could see this in the mainstream evolutionary psychologists as, as we talked about, well, if, if the mind is, is like a computer, well, a computer doesn't have an I, a computer doesn't have a we, right? So how do you account for these terms in your theorizing? I think I gave this example as well of Robert Sapolsky, the, the primatologist or whatever, and uh, one of these free will deniers. And when he's talking about the nervous system, he, he says, well, the brain chooses, the brain decides, 
okay, these are teleological terms, and what you're doing is anthropomorphizing the brain, right? You're imagining that there's a little homunculus or kind of something like that in the brain. And again, the lesson is that if you try to get rid of, of free will and just how we talk about these terms, it sends, tends to pop up somewhere else where it doesn't belong. Uh, Corey Anton, I, I don't know if you're familiar with him. Uh, he is a professor, I think, of communication studies. He was uh, an early adopter of, of YouTube. He's got like hundreds of videos on YouTube and he's a really smart guy. He's read a lot of Heidegger and the phenomenologists and so on. Uh, he he kind of sets up you know, this stuff in, in this way. He says that some people say that when you look both ways before crossing the street that you're a determinist. In other words, you believe that causal forces exist in nature, right? Well, of course. If this is what we mean by determinism, notice how it is positioned against indeterminism or randomness. And, you know, that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But now we mean something very different than what happens when one billiard, billiard ball runs into another. In this case, the agent looks both ways because he or she can entertain the possibility of being hit and alters the behavior accordingly. Right? We can also reason that life is pointless and meaningless and we throw ourselves in front of a car to, to get hit. Right? That's, that's something that we're capable of doing. Um, I want to mention that uh, I think it was Sartre who you know, emphasized how that freedom can, can be, in, in a sense, nauseating or anxiety provoking, the freedom that we have as human beings. And he gave the example of, of hiking up you know, a mountain pass and, and looking over the edge. Now, part of the anxiety that we experience is the possibility of falling to our death. But he suggests that another part of the anxiety is the recognition that you could throw yourself off the edge, right? And, and uh, I think this is what Kierkegaard referred to as, as existential dread, you know, the, the recognition of, you know, these possibilities that are open to us as the kind of beings that we are. So some questions that, like, if you were in a debate with a determinist, like a physical determinist, these are some of the questions that, awkward questions that I would pose to them. I would ask them, what is the ontological status of a possibility, right? Is a possibility something that you can understand on a purely material efficient level? Or do we have to acknowledge something like an introspective first person account in order to make sense of a possibility? How does one account for the fact that we can talk to ourselves, right? Is talking to ourselves just some material efficient unfolding of events? Or again, are we not dealing with, with concepts and, and we're kind of looping back in this introspective dialogue? What is the difference between a cause and a motive? What is the past? What is the future? Is the future a fiction, right? Is it not real, right? How are you guys able to, to make it to class this morning, you know? If, if you hadn't some idea of you know, where you needed to be, when you needed to be there, and, and why it was worth doing. What is creativity? You know, is creativity just randomness? Or is creativity like a free play, you know, in that inner exchange, that we have this capacity to negate what is, right? Well, there's this, this image or idea or whatever, and, and I'm going to play with that. I'm going to negate that. And, and well, what is different from that? Or what is the opposite of that? And what is the opposite of that? And so on. And we get into this transcendental kind of free play in, uh, in understanding the situation. What is a promise, right? Is a promise something that we're going to be able to understand in a material efficient sense? Or is that a commitment that I'm going to commit my will to some you know, series of events for the sake of something that is meaningful or important? Um, that's what I want to say here. I just want to read you some quotes from Nietzsche who had some really interesting things to say. He says, uh, that which is determined freedom of the will is essentially the affect of superiority in relation to him or her who must obey. A man or woman who wills commands something within him or herself that renders obedience. We are at the same time the commanding and the obeying parties. Right? So again, there's this, this conflict within ourselves, and we throw our weight or our intentional resources behind one part of it and affirm one side of it or deny the other. Um, I'm just going to read you the bottom little line here. Unfree will is mythology. In real life, it is only a matter of strong and weak wills. I love that, right? Um, it means that, you know, yes, you are... You are, you know, burdened in all kinds of ways by your biology, and you are restricted in, in countless ways by, you know, your, your culture, society, whatever. 
but there is still that capacity that, that you have, possibilities that are open to you, and it is up to you what you're going to do with that. And, and you shape, to a large degree, who you will become. Um, and that's a really important message that, uh, that, unfortunately, we're not hearing very much of these days. Um, this is just a fun little quote. Um, it is almost always a symptom of what is lacking in him or herself when a thinker senses in every causal connection and psychological necessity something of constraint, need, compulsion to obey, pressure, and unfreedom. It is suspicious to have such feelings. A person betrays him or herself. Such people do not wish to be answerable to anything or blamed for anything, and owing to an inward self-contempt, seek to lay the blame for themselves somewhere else. I love that quote as well. Um, now, I think there is something about you know, denying free will that is a kind of evasion of responsibility. I think there's, there's people who, who do that. But I think there's also a big part of it that is just having just the utmost respect for a scientific attitude and, and they just kind of are working within this frame and they can't see a way out of it, right? That's, that's you know, an, another way of looking at this. But uh, we're gonna wrap up there. Uh, we'll do the reflection papers.